Hello everybody and thank you for joining tonight. This is your host Nino and I am taking you along in this episode on another book review adventure with Common Lisp Recipes, a problem solution approach by Edmund Weitz, a book of 2016, a sweet 700 something pager, which is very much in the style of a cookbook for halfway complex questions. Itself, the book is modest and says that it is not for beginners, but in reality it does teach a lot of basic concepts and better so than some of the introductory works it itself recommends. And <laughs> you see, it is from A Press and they are unfortunately, you know, sort of hit and miss. Some of their books are brilliant, like this one, and others truly are not, and one wonders how ones get published and others maybe not and whether there are any criteria of uniform nature. So jumping straight into it and perhaps slightly increasing the view for you so that you can see a little bit better what we are looking at text-wise. What it is and what it is not, he is right, it is not an introduction to common lisp. What he is recommending you is, uh, you know, the usual suspects, namely, lately people always recommend practical common lisp, which I absolutely do not recommend, and let over Lambda, a book on macros that sounds like, it reminds you of talking to a condescending teenager, and it is really unpleasant to read. For me, myself, this is just my personal opinion on it. So, unfortunately, the books he does recommend for you to start with are nothing all that great, and I recommend you anything else. But this book itself does then actually go on and give you nice examples. It also recommends on Lisp, which I regard as, you know, somewhat better. Like, certainly better than, than the other two recommendations. So, then, let's look at the next one. Here, here, he is showing you already how to be manipulating trees and stacks. Like, I find that rather nice that he is not just, you know, leaving you with such standard structures like P-lists and A-lists and things like that, which just simply faces the reality that with Lisp you can have any data structure you desire. And also he does show you how to be working with stacks and then just shortly afterwards queues, and how to implement a queue. So a FIFO and a, before that a LIFO data structure. And one could say that this is actually not even such an advanced concept and that it is sort of something which also beginners might be interested in, which is why I'm telling that this book is not requiring who knows what advanced in Lisp. And in reality, even if you have just started it and have something else to consult with in for the one or the other more complex matter per chance, this one already can be very useful and I clearly do recommend it. Now, here he also has a nice table, like two nice tables showing you character and string comparisons and how to do the things in a case sensitive and case insensitive fashion. So again, this is perhaps material which isn't all that advanced, but which certainly is you know, nice to have in one place. He also correctly points out that with string comparisons you better rely on equal on and equal p and that echo will yeah be as useless as echo normally is. Well, jumping forward, you're having here also interesting special array topics. For instance, uh, the adjustment of arrays as well as using an array as a window into another array. Now, this is something which Lisp is famous for, for facilitating that, but it is not commonly shown, and he does actually show it. 
Then there is another chapter entirely on hash tables, maps, and sets, and only later does he actually talk about things like association and a-lists. But instead, you do actually start straight with hash tables, which is a modern way to view the like key value problem or the like dictionary task in Lisp. He does treat that too, though, and you are having here how to be accessing uh, elements of association lists, and he does all update things with set on the ASOC, which is like the more modern way of handling it, rather than um, set thing always the entire association list. That is, you work with the elements rather than with the entire list itself. He also mentions, you know, at some point that association lists might be preferable if you want something more printable and something for perhaps very small amounts of um, elements. And after association lists come classical property lists. Yeah, here he has the advantages also of association lists. He's saying that uh, they, are, they, they can be... Um, used as lists as opposed to you know the unprintable non-list natured hash tables that you can customize tests on uh, association lists that you're having a reverse lookup function and a couple of other things and yeah and that you can actually if you if you don't overwrite a key, you can just double a key temporarily and that you can thereby uh, still keep previous key value associations. Now, I regard that as a really fringe topic, though. And anyway, after, after that, you're getting a classical introduction to um, property lists. And again, they are set and read in a modern way with set and just like with association lists and hash tables, he compares here property lists and association lists. And he tells you that, like, when to prefer property lists over a lists. Well, when you want to have something maybe more easily readable and more immediately accessible for function application. In other words, no reasons at all. But hey, that at least leaves you some clarity that there isn't some mysterious great advantage of the one over the other. I actually like association lists more because you get along the elements faster and um, therefore you have, in my eyes, a tendency to have a somewhat faster access. Then here, the book is really great. It shows you a really nice overview over the entire mapping zoo. And here you basically have like the different functions that would be sort of applicable on that. You also have a more general overview on the preceding page that, you know, you're, he, he goes for these main functions, you know, like map current, map list essentially, and their variations. And uh, that you're having here like what is processing elements, what is processing tails, whether things are being functionally listed or somehow destructively concatenated or maybe whether they're not kept at all really and you know just processed for the sake of side effects so again this is not all that much of an advanced topic but just demonstrated in an excellent fashion and i also like this example here of map car of the length of, of listed numbers and because each number is listed you know for itself the map car is giving you always once whereas the map list because it is always working on the rest of this list is giving you a countdown and then here you're seeing uh, examples where listed values are being concatenated or just listed so <laughs> Again, a, a nice contrast, which is sort of making the use more obvious. Like, this is 
Not something which, for instance, uh, you see in, in the introductory, one of the introductory books at least he recommends. Then as nice as that was, we're getting to <laughs> the equality operations. And <laughs> his rule of thumb, I, I find very funny, like... Uh, I, I totally wouldn't share the sentiment, but you know, author is of course free to free to do whatever he wants in his book. He's saying not to use ECK, generally speaking, to use ECL, which is the general test in common Lisp, and to use equal and equal p only in rare cases. I totally don't follow. Like, he doesn't want that one uses ECK because he basically says that ECL is like. The essentially same thing <laughs> that it is better better than ek well one can see it that way or not one can say that if one is already using a crappy predicate why not just go for the fastest one and that equal and equal p will only be helpful in rare cases all oh, that is unless you would like to compare list thin things or you know in the case of equal p structs which happen to not be compatible with equal like um like two two same printing structs will still appear not equal so i actually think that equal p is extremely useful and equal a close second and that they would be useful only in exceptional cases well no wouldn't say yeah then he talks about um concurrency and here in particular, about threads, which I don't care all that much, but that you have here these parallel map functions. And you see, that is really the great advantage if you adopt a style of programming relying more on the mapping functions, because they are immediate parallel equivalents, which you can easily incorporate through using some like parallel operations library and and that will just immediately speed up your code without any particular handling of synchronizing threads and whatnot nonsense by yourself like if you just get used to map cutting things then you are already in for some decent concurrency and parallelization tasks with lisp so yeah that actually had wholeheartedly agree with as a choice. And then, you know, he also talks about things like unwind protect, which are not even something outside of common Lisp introductions. So, you know, that that's actually quite a decent topic for anyone. And afterwards he gets into... Yeah, object-oriented programming and the common Lisp object system. And that gets quite involved. And at some point, you are invited through a couple of exercises whose aim is to create a systematic between such uh, quadriliteral, quadrilateral shapes and, and like what has what properties. And given that many Lisp introductions don't really have a chapter on the common Lisp object system, that's maybe, you know, a good, a good um, additional material in order to get a little bit more acquainted with that area of common Lisp. Although I personally must also say, I haven't really ever found that all that useful simply because there's so much other stuff you can do in Lisp. Anyway, then you're shown a couple of file operation examples, whereby I must say, in general, they were a little bit confusing, perhaps more than helpful, but how to read and write binary data is shown in a simple and obvious way, where you're just simply looping along bytes. Now, continuing further, we arrive at something which isn't really all that much of an advanced topic, but which is found in this book, namely, how to do tracing. He also mentions graphical tracing, which some environments offer. I can't tell you a specifically interesting one, 
and that is not common lisp though but a racket like a racket actually has a very nice way of visually showing you a program trace which otherwise you know traces are not beautiful to look at going further you know this book is like a collection of special topics. It doesn't really go from any A to B. It doesn't really teach you how to do something in any sequential way. It's just like a collection of curiosities, which you may look at in any fashion that you um, find proper and interesting for your own case at hand. And here he's showing you how to be undoing definition definitions, namely with make unbound and thereby just freeing the system from past definitions and talking of definitions the next thing he's showing you is what can you be doing with um, optimizing your functions and like like how how do you do things a little bit faster and he tells you that there is uh, such a classical principle where 80% of the execution time is spent in less than 20% of the code. And your task is to a great part figuring out where these 20% of the code are and to optimize those because optimizing the rest likely won't change who knows how much in the real general time your program is running. And that for that, you're using a profiler. You can also make uh, declarations, for instance, to optimize the speed. And like that, this is a function without having, um, without getting optimization hints from the compiler. But if you say that you declare optimize speed just simply as a second line, then you will get some hints from the compiler what you could do uh, to make things run faster and here you can see a couple of things are that it is uncertain of the type and uh, if you would be giving the type of what you're working with and perhaps what you expect from the function that optimizations of the function by the compiler would be much easier to do and quite consequently here is <laughs> Also showing you how you can declare things. For instance, you're declaring them uh, as double float. And that way, getting functions to operate faster. And you do that with declare, and you can declare multiple things at once. Now, regarding further acceleration, he is also talking about inlining functions so as to avoid function calls and despite one might have the idea that you know a tail call optimization and some things that the compiler should be smart enough to do things let me tell you that even a simple replacing of uh, function calls with iteration rather than you know recurs recursion already in practice at least for myself speeds things up considerably like it's less cute but it is certainly faster and inlining is another such idea well basically where you do not repeatedly call a function but where it is internally transformed in lisp so as to be in that place where it is needed so it doesn't need to be fetched from anywhere like you do not really need to make an expensive function call and while you may say that these were like core Lisp everyday topics, you know, how to make things faster, how to use some more fringe elements of the language, towards the end he also gets into topics of how to interface uh, Lisp functions with other programming languages, such as here, for instance, talking about how to be calling Lisp functions from C. And that is certainly something which one may sometimes need. And it's, it's nice to have it in one's recipe book. Uh, regarding Java, the clear advice is to use ABC 
L, like arm to bear common lisp. So, for those of you which are oogling Android, that might look at first as the most advisable option, but be aware that I have read elsewhere that it might be incompatible with Android. I haven't ever tried it. But before you la like jump up, hooray, we have ABCL. ABCL is really great if you want to have something on your Windows machine without needing administration rights in order to install new, new programs because you can just use it as a, uh, you know, Java jar file. Still, it may be not necessarily the easy solution to, to all your issues, in particular if you want to do Android programming. Anyway, then he is talking about reading and writing popular data formats, starting with JSON, but also continuing towards XML just afterwards. So you do, you do get a couple of hints how to handle some very real world problems because to get data in JSON or XML format is certainly something expectable. Now, he also then goes on to talk about how to create uh, graphical user interfaces. And that's an interesting topic all by itself because there is no standardized way to do so. And it shows. You know, so I didn't all that much like the Java example here given. And yeah, he does use ABCL again in order to somehow get access to the Java um, GUI creation facilities. And then afterwards, he goes on to show you yeah, how to do this for mobile applications, which is really funny because he's advising you to use Mockel, which was celebrated when it appeared as a sensational new Lisp that is uh, usable on mobile platforms. But it was not usable all that easily, and you still had to create the graphical user interface separately. And if you now, nowadays Google its web page, at least at the end of 2022 or beginning of 2023, it was just dead as the dodo. Like there wasn't a trace of Mockle left. And actually, if you want to use Lisp on your uh, mobile, I clearly have another recommendation for you. And that is called Common Lisp Repl. So this, this green Lambda thing, it is available for Android as well as iOS and when I start it you're actually having yeah a, a thing with three like segments up here you write your code in the middle you can ask for immediate evaluations and this is where you get the replies from your Lisp system and you have that for both Android and iOS and <laughs> it's much better than fussing around with um, such like long since dead things like Mockle. And yeah, I may have jumped in uh, over it and I just found it again. He also shows you how to create uh, GUIs with Lispworks. The only trouble being Lispworks is a commercial product. So it's not open source and I believe it was the follow-up to Harlequin Common Lisp or something like that, which once upon the time in the 90s was one of these, or 80s, was one of these famous earlier Lisp systems which were usable on something that is not Unix and not a Lisp machine. But even here he criticizes that the facility offered by Lispworks is, is like giant in its documentation, 1,300 pages and more. And he also mentions that it's not that it's interface builder, which it is supposed to be using in order to make your job easier, isn't all that powerful and leaves uh, to be desired. So that said, yeah, really, I think common this should do something about the GUI topic. And then what I find actually really neat and nice is how do you compile things 
in different Lisp environments. So that's exactly what the practical common Lisp is never showing you. And here you have just simply a couple of ways of how to do this. So he's showing you how to compile under SBCL, how to compile under Closure, Common Lisp, and finally how to compile under ECL. <laughs> I really think it was not all that hard to show it in the other book too. Yeah, and then finally as a as an end topic, he's also showing you how to work with dates and times, which is a bit of a fringe topic perhaps, but you know, this is quite an exhaustive book and showing you such things just as well. And with that, we have covered some of the topics which are inside. Of course, there's even more because this is really quite a not too not too slim book <laughs> that I, exactly for that reason, like very, very much. And I believe that if you want to see some more advanced topics or get a little bit of mental exercise, that this list book certainly would be a nice addition to whatever else you may stick to for an introduction. And with that, today's review is over. Thank you very much for having been here and I do hope you will join in next time again. Would be happy if you subscribe and become a regular viewer. Until then, I wish you to have a wonderful time and from me, goodbye.